The language of the forest is a beautiful language to learn. When you first build a shelter and slept under the sky, such things as the night noises were mysterious and somewhat frightening. But as the years roll by, those same noises and the memories will give you peace and you will find that, perhaps, the world isn't such a tough place after all. It's a testimonial to a simple way of doing things on a grand scale that somehow refreshes the human spirit. To come here and have this unique experience of being together in fellowship in this very remote place in this big, funky old, wooden, creaky, history-filled building. Dartmouth's interest in Moose Lock started right back with the founding of the Outing Club. Fred Harris, who was a Dartmouth class of 11, had the idea of the Outing Club. And it all sort of stems from this famous little letter that he wrote to the Daily Dartmouth. Question, what is there to do at Dartmouth in the winter gives rise to the thought that we might take better advantage of the opportunities which the admirable situation of our college offers and he proposed skiing and snowshoeing and things like that, including uh, a big midwinter trip, say to Musalak. That's what he said. By taking the initiative in this matter, Dartmouth might well become the originator of a branch of college organized sport hitherto undeveloped by American colleges. Respectfully submitted, F.H. Harris, 11. Now, of course, Moose Lock is the closest 4,000-foot mountain to Hanover. It's the southwesternmost of the big mountains of the Whites, and it was the big commanding mountain, the place you'd want to go. These two Dartmouth alumni, the uh, Woodworth brothers, came into possession of the Summit House. At that time, the Appalachian Mountain Club was starting to have these huts scattered around in, in the White Mountains, at Lake of the Clouds, and at Madison, and at Carter Notch, and places like that. And so these Woodworth brothers had the idea, well, Dartmouth has a place, if they had a place right on the top of the mountain, they could really be in a commanding position. They gave them this, this little circular tract of land on the top and the Summit House. And the Summit House became very popular right away. I mean, as a spot where you could go with a camp group, get a meal and be taken care of right on the top of Moose Lock. So, as of 1920, the DOC has its foothold on Moose Lock. But what was it that got the DOC interested in that wild eastern side of the mountain, the side where the lodge would eventually be built? The answer was skiing. It was in 1927 that the then Dartmouth ski coach had the idea as an end of the season event to have a Moose Lock Down Mountain race. The idea was to run this race on the carriage road. The carriage road was an old, narrow, winding road that ran from the top of the mountain down to near Warren. And it was very successful. Uh, it was repeated several years in 1931. A fellow named Jack McCrillis, class of 1919, took on the challenge of filming this race. And that film was shown to the National Ski Association, which was then very much a sort of jumping and cross-country operation, and sort of, sort of get them into the idea that, you know, downhill racing was really something special. So in fact, Moose Lock really played a pivotal role in sort of getting the early genesis of skiing going. Skiing culminated in 1933 when they held the first ever national downhill ski race. It was a very successful event. A Dartmouth guy won it, um, but it was, it was still being run on this very ancient road. What happened that very same winter, uh, over on Cannon Mountain, uh, a new ski trail had been cut the previous fall. It was used for the first time that winter, the Taft Trail. And it was the first sort of modern ski trail. It was wide, it was open, it was big, it was very exciting, 
And the Dartmouth people said, oh my, this is really the new, the way things are going to go. It's clear. Um, we got to do something. In 1931, these two Dartmouth undergrads, um, um, Warren Braley and Farmer Kirkham, who were class of 1933, came into this area, which was then owned by the uh, Parker Young Logging Company, which um, Sherm Adams was managing. Braley and Kirkham came to him and said, you know, we'd like to build, we'd like to look at the possibility of building a cabin up in the ravine. And then went up farther up the valley to found a nice stand of old of spruce up there and they and they built this cabin. Certainly there had been for over a decade at that time, Dartmouth people on top of the mountain who had climbed it up it from the west side and the southwest side up the Glencliff Trail, which is the old historic route to the top. But this area down here was really terra incognito. To be able to look up the mountain from these old logging camp sites that they went by on the way up there, look up and suddenly see 2,400 feet of vertical staring you right in the face. That was something that the Charlie Proctor and Otto Schneebs and Dan Hatch saw and said, boy, this is a real opportunity. Um, Adams uh, sold Dartmouth a little chunk of land that ran basically from where the Ravine Lodge is now up to the south peak of the mountain and up to the north peak, a triangular chunk. So he was a Dartmouth class of 1920. And uh, he had been president of the Island Club. He was this powerhouse guy. He, he was famous in his time. He and another student hiked did this legendary hike where they hiked down the whole chain of cabins, which at that time started up north of Littleton, New Hampshire, hiked down through Franconia Notch, up around the north side of Moose Lock, down past Mount Cuban to Hanover, all that way, 83 miles in a 24-hour period, from midnight to midnight. And uh, this story is, you know, it's, it was absolute legend. It was just emblematic of the kind of de determination that he had. Sherm Adams plays a critical role in the whole story of how Dartmouth was able to become involved up here on Mount Moose Lock. You know, the first sort of act of generosity on Adams' part was letting these two undergrads, um, uh, Braley and Kirkham, come up here and establish the cabin. And th then the next thing that he was involved in was this whole land transaction. And on that, they cut the Hell's Highway ski trail. And uh, it was a bunch of undergrads, uh, you know, with a couple of the outing club professors would come up and sort of look in on them, but it was basically this undergrad crew cut this trail out, and it was just phenomenally steep. And then they took the old horse stable that had been sitting down here from one of the old logging operations, and they renovated it, made a very, you know, basic plumbing system and, you know, some insulation in the walls and a few other things like that. It was a very comfortable building. They had completely changed its nature from being a, a horse, <laughs> horse camp. Uh, it, had been, it had been thoroughly cleansed and uh, remodeled, and they had a very comfortable sort of half-reclining seats around a big uh, pot-bellied stove. Ford Sayre, class of 1933, who had been involved in the, um, on the, in the cutting crew, uh, with his new uh, just-married wife, uh, Peggy, he came up to run the place, and it was a challenging assignment. February 24th, 1935. We counted noses this morning and discovered that our accommodation for 28 had been stretched to 46. One veteran said that the living room looked like a French station during the war. It took two shifts to feed them all breakfast and Forty's pancakes went like the proverbial hotcakes. Peggy Sayre, 1935. By the end of 1933, and no one could have foreseen this even a year before, Dartmouth is on Moose Lock with this 900 and something acre par parcel and this phenomenal ski trail and this little old horse stable at the bottom of this one ski trail and these few other small ski trails on logging roads are showing people that there's an incredible interest in this sport of skiing. And then, in September 28th of 1935, the ravine camp, the old horse stable, burns down. 
the wind is sort of taken from their sails in some way. They know they want to keep moving forward. They've got the ski trail. They've got the excitement going. Um, but now that they are forced to sort of step back and take a moment to think about it, they realize they're sitting on this little teeny triangle of land, and they're completely surrounded by land that's owned by the logging company by Parker Young. And they realize it just is not responsible for us to come in here and build a new building from scratch on this little teeny inholding of land. The first thing we have to do before we do anything else is buy the rest of the land. They are fortunate in that the negotiator, the man on the other side of the table, is Sherman Adams. He is on the edge of the razor, really, because he's responsible for, to his the board of directors of the Parker Young Company to make money and to keep all their options open. At the same time, he's an outing club man, and he believes in this stuff. And so he's willing to be extremely creative to try and find a way to make the transaction possible. So the outing club embarks on this campaign that drags out over two years to try and raise money to buy the land. And they go through a whole variety of fundraising schemes. As a result of all these projects and businesses and all the things that were going on, the outing club went through a whole enormous restructuring in 1937, uh, 1936-1937. And Will was right at the center of that whole thing. Will Brown, J. Wilcox Brown, class of 1937, was a leader in the period of time when the outing club really needed it most. He knew Sherm Adams well, and he knew the outing club trustees well. President Hopkins decided that what the outing club really needed was a board of trustees of its own. So he appointed such a board, headed by Professor Charles Proctor, who was a classmate of the president's, and a very trusted friend of his. If something is going to happen, it usually takes a quiet leader. And that man, in the case of the Moose Lock development, was Charlie Proctor. Halsey Edgerton was put on there as the terrible no man. He could uh, stop any project that he figured was unwise because of his fiscal controls. He was a key person in the whole Moose Lock development, I think, because of what he didn't negate, what he didn't say no to. The, the new element that came into the picture was this fellow named Ross McKinney. I tried to picture myself walking into a classroom with a PV in one hand and a canoe paddle in the other saying, OK, here I am. What will we talk about? I still had my doubts about being a teacher but I was swayed to a great extent by that forest law, to give that the rest may live. Larry Lugy deserves major credit for getting Ross to Hanover. He was um, active in the class of 29, loved the out of doors, had gone to a camp in Maine where Ross was a guide, and was convinced that the man was really unique and had a, a marvelous set of aptitudes and a personality that he could offer to Dartmouth. Dartmouth owns many thousands of acres of forest land scattered across New Hampshire. Why couldn't I take the college students out into these forests and show them all these wonderful things? Thousands of acres. Certainly that was a big enough classroom. I could still carry my ax in one hand. About the only thing I would have to change would be my woodsman's vocabulary. As employees of the DOC, Ross and I began working the same day, which was September 1st of 1937. We both went on the payroll at that time. We have footage of him going out with students and building a cabin for himself out on Oak Hill. It gives you an inkling, a little bit of an inkling, of the sort of the things that he was able to do. I suspect that the construction of Ross's home convinced Halsey Edgerton that this was a unique woodsman. And that made a, a major significance in the subsequent decisions that were reached by the outing club trustees with regard to progress at Moose Lock. But ultimately, 
Dartmouth Auditing Club just cannot raise enough money to meet Parker Young's legitimate demands. And although they still had the skiing trails here on the mountain, they knew that the key thing was to be right here in the ravine, where you'd be ski right in the door, practically. And so the realization that they would not be able to, build, to buy land, to buy the remaining land and protect this area before they started to build anything, was certainly a very low point. Basically what Sherm Adams does is he says, we are not interested in selling this land to you. At the same time, we're going to leave it more or less as it is for the indefinite future. And Will trusts him because Sherm Adams is an outing club man. So instead of these two land on the one hand, building on the other, we were, we were down to, are we going to do something with a building? And so for Sherm Adams to turn around and say, take all the money that you've raised so far for buying land and use it to build something, that just changes the whole picture. I guess he'd given us some pretty good clue, though, that if we wanted to use some of the timber at the lower edge of the old cutting, which was not too far from the lodge, the lodge site, that that would be a possibility. So Ross and I then went up and went up the old go-back trail, found these wonderful big uh, spruce trees, the like of which you didn't find very many places in New Hampshire at that time up to three feet, feet in diameter and 60 feet or more long. And um, Ross, of course, could readily see that these were loggable and uh, that we had the, a downhill skid to take them to the campsite. And so we came back with that report. That, and that was the, the basis then for the major decision of the trustees to go ahead late in the fall of 1937. And Ross is sort of tapping his foot and saying, well, you know, if you're going to get those logs down here, we've got to cut them during the winter when the conditions are right. We've got to start bringing supplies in, all this sort of stuff. What the DOC needed most at this stage was labor, skilled labor. Fortunately, right in the village of Warren, right at the bottom of the mountain, were all the men that they'd need. Ross did the hiring, but I made the suggestions of where to go. He, he, he knew how to go into a community like that and with a few, few entrees and work it out. Uh, there were several families, the Witchers, uh, Moody's, Andrews, go way back in the town of Warren. Uh, these are men who had worked in the woods all their lives, and many of them had been idled by the Great Depression and were happy to find work in the woods if they had a capable man to lead them. And they found that leader in Ross. So now we have logs coming down the hill finally a plan that everyone can more or less agree on. In May, the final key player emerges on the scene. That's Dick Goddard, class of 1920, volunteers to step up and be chairman of the Moose Lock Building Committee. My going with, the, with Ross it was about as smooth an association as I ever had with a person. Ross and I had just seen the mesh. Ross was the boss, and that was it. Yeah. And I think if Ross had had a less resilient chairman of the building committee than Dick Goddard, he would have been hard pressed at times. After mud season is over, they uh, start working on starting to build the foundations for this place, which proved to be a truly Herculean task. What they ran into was a swamp quarry almost. <laughs> You go down through eight feet of boulders, and then you get to clay underneath that. It rained. It was heavy rains a lot of the time. But I don't think anyone in that had figured it would be severe as it was. Um, Ross just dealt with it uh, by digging in and moving the rocks out of the way. And they had uh, a device uh, called the gin pole which is a vertical spar of spruce and a diagonal one that uh, could be swung around so you could pick up a rock and swing it around and drop it in a different location. And that um, 
was a device that didn't have a lot of automatic features to it. You, if you didn't pay attention, or if you weren't holding onto that handle, it could come around and slap you. That process um, was extraordinarily time consuming. And uh, it was really not until the end of July of that summer of 1938 that they had the foundation hole basically dug. And all energy now shifts to building the foundation of the lodge. Okay, now the challenge with the foundation, as you've, you know, we've seen some of the places where the walls are really better than two feet thick. I mean, there are some sections that are 30 inches thick. And they really felt they needed to have them be on that massive a scale because of all the water and all the clay and everything moving around and, and things heaving and stuff. They wanted something that was just not going to move. Well, of course, concrete consists of cement, uh, sand, and gravel, none of which existed here on the site. The truck and two men cost us $12, and the team cost $7 per day, but the sand cost only 15 cents per yard. Sand is cheap, but it is so heavy that the cost of moving it is almost heartbreaking. So we put the crews to work swamping and leveling a road from the end of the truck road to camp about eight-tenths of a mile. This made it possible to eliminate the team and for the truck to deliver three loads of sand each day right to the camp, but it still cost $12 a day to haul the material that cost only $1.35. So it took most of August to finally get the whole foundation poured. So now they're many weeks behind schedule. And, and now the, the real work is just about to start. They're, they haven't laid a single log on this on this enormous thing yet. It's the end of August. I, what I didn't think was possible, I didn't think it was possible that we were gonna operate in the winter of 39. From, they say January on of 39. All they had to work with on the, in this construction was axes, two-man crosscut saws and bow saws, ramps, levers, teams of horses, one team of horses, and so they started in to work with that stuff at the end of August. They realized they were up against a complete time deadline. They had to get this thing done by the end of the building season, the end of that fall, and they know that up here in the mountain that's going to be soon. Then it was slow work hauling and lifting the giant spruce with a derrick, fitting them between the corner posts and spiking them solid. And then, of course, comes the greatest meteorological event in the history of New England, in the eyes of many, the 38 hurricane. Great good fortune of the uh, hurricane's timing was that those logs were all, <laughs> all there and peeled and ready to use before the hurricane came along. Now, if we'd been a year later, the hurricane would have been an enormous disruption. Certainly, we've been through an incredibly arduous task of getting this foundation built. Now we've gotten up to the level of the floor and the 1938 hurricane comes along, wipes out all the ski trails on the mountain, um, does an incredible amount of damage and flooding all over New England. You would think that would be reason enough to stop. You know, I don't see anything in the record anywhere that even suggests that they were thinking about pulling out. Once the corner posts were up, it was like, all right, let's get those logs in here. And they just moved on it. By one means or other, you get the logs up onto the, onto the gable ends there, and then you have to get them up into the notches that you cut out for them so they can sit there. And you can imagine that trying to move those logs, and that literally that top one, I, I roughly calculated out just sort of in my head, and it came up with a weight of about two, two and a quarter tons or something like that. I expect that every day they'd kind of you know, step back from it and say, wow, you know, they were so committed. The local people who are building this place are the kind of people who, for whom figuring out a clever way to do something with what you have is like the acme of their achievement. They were people who'd worked together most of their lives. They were from one town, 
many of them were interrelated. And uh, Ross had uh, proved himself to them. The local foreman, Zeke Moody, man of all crafts, somehow managed to build that chimney and have the cement set properly so that you don't find any cracks in the chimney even today. I think there was a fairly regular train of visitors who came up who wanted to see this thing. And certainly some of the pictures that we see of these guys up here with their fedoras and, and their glasses and looking the thing over. Of course, Dick Goddard was not dressed that way. He's always in the lumber shirt. But finally, the double roofs were finished and the walls caulked with oakum. Then house cleaning started. We finished sometime around the first of the year, if I remember correctly. I stayed at the lodge the remainder of that winter. Did they do the right thing in, in building this enormous place and, and creating this unique and somewhat haphazard in terms of functionality place? And the short answer, in fact, the answer for the next almost 30, 40 years was hard to tell, you know. Uh, it, it went through all kinds of financial turmoil. Um, it was really a white elephant for a big period of time. We started the freshman trips about 1935. And if we uh, were able to get 100 freshmen to sign up and come, we did well. <clears throat> Now it's practically the entire freshman class. And it's a unique part of their introduction to Dartmouth. It just became obvious that it was the right place to bring freshmen at the end of their little trip in the woods. Just generally enjoy the outdoors and the ambience inside that building. That just worked a spell on people. You're doing something for that entire time that you're together, that you enjoy, that doesn't involve this uh, kaleidoscopic changing of scene that is so characteristic of modern life. It became embedded, absolutely embedded, in the culture of this 230-year-old institution. It just was something that mattered. In a part, it's a wistful yearning for a, a simp simpler, bygone day, I guess. But I think it may be more than that. Hopefully, it would it'd be expressed to in terms of people that enjoy that sort of life together, being able to be constructive citizens in a very tough world. The story of how it came to be and all that development around skiing and all the other facts that brought it to life that were so really unplanned and so um, miraculous in some way. And I don't believe that I ever saw in all my research any thought ever that it would be the place where people would be greeted to come to Dartmouth. That was all just a serendipity, really. But once it was a reality, that was what made it have this enduring value that has stuck with it through 60 years of change and brings us to where we are today. It's the place you come down to after you've climbed Mount Musalak. As I sat down one evening, t'was in a small cafe, a forty-year-old waitress to me these words did say, Now I see you are a logger and not a common bum, Cause no one but a logger stirs coffee with his thumb. I had a logger lover, there's none like him today. If you poured whiskey on it, He'd eat a bale of hay.